So, hi everyone, my name is Adam Rutterman, and thanks for coming to BoundyCraft. This is the fourth or fifth iteration. Uh, happy to be here. And uh, let's kind of jump right on into it. Oh, we have some more people coming. Great. So let's get started with some introductions. Again, hi, my name is Adam Rutterman. I'm the practice director for Bug Bounty Services at NCC Group. I, uh, who's looked a little bit about me, why you should listen to me, and why I'm here? So uh, I got my start in security in the United States Air Force. I was an IT security guy, uh, which eventually landed me at the National Security Agency in the US. I was on the NSA's red team uh, as a technical lead. Uh, I got out of the Air Force and I worked at what is now the network defense side of US Cyber Command. At the time, it was a place called Joint Task Force for Global Network Operations. And I worked on the defense watch floor there. Uh, I then went on to Booz Allen Hamilton where I did a bunch of management consulting in the, com in, the techno in the government and technology space. And then I went and went, uh, moved out to California and became one of the first employees at SYNAC. I was one of the first operational people hired after they closed their Series A. Uh, it was a fantastic and um, really a great learning time for me. Um, after that, I left Synac and joined Facebook, where I led Facebook's bug bounty program, among other things, user data protection, account lifecycle management, and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, and then I was invited by NCC Group, who was a vendor of mine, to uh, take over the existing bug bounty practice that was already there. Um, and here I am today. So what's the agenda today? This is about empathy. So we're talking about like bug bounty, why is this happening? But I think what we're really going to do today is talk about why things happen the way they do and what's going on with bug bounty and vulnerability disclosure a little bit. There's a non-agenda here too, which is I'm not defending bad behavior by programs by any means, even though it might seem like that in a moment, and you'll see why I get to it. And I'm certainly not defending mediocre or poorly uh, poorly conceived bug bounty or vulnerability disclosure programs too. These are very real issues. And uh, I would love to talk about them with you all. So when you, um, when we're done here, later this evening, out there, when we're grabbing lunch, whatever, grab me, I'd love to have a drink, talk about it and hear your experiences. Uh, these are really valuable things for us to hear. So, there's really three personas, groups of people, playing in bug bounty. One of them, <laughs> our researchers, a lot of the folks here. And it's very easy to get wrapped up in the sexiness of bug bounty from a marketing perspective. The stuff that we post on Instagram, the parties, um, the rewards, all this really cool stuff. But um, the reality is, is that bug hunting is actually a really lonely job. It's really, really lonely. And your experiences are, um, individual, unique, tiresome, and um, frequently solo. And I think there's a lot of room for us to help um, build a community and talk about those problems. Some of that stuff already exists, but I think we can certainly formalize it more. But what is this like for the people who actually run bug bounty programs and BDPs? Like, what's the, what does this actually feel like? Well, there's a lot of meetings with people with suits. And there's even more meetings with people in suits. And there's even more meetings with people in suits. I'm not joking. Like, I've dressed like this for years in my professional career, and I seriously never spent more time in meetings with people in suits and techie companies that didn't wear suits until I started running bug bounty programs. Just being real. When I left Facebook, the entire legal team showed up to my going away. Literally, like the whole legal team, because they all knew me, the compliance people, uh, the international compliance people, the payments and finance team people, um, the non-corruption people, all those people showed up because unfortunately, well, for better or worse, they had dealt with me at some point. And that experience is universal across our customers and the customers of the other people in the space as well. Um, you notice how these people are happy? I'll tell you the meetings don't usually end that way. Just to be real for a moment. So, you might, like, like, let's just be real for a second. Like, given all these meetings, given all this hassle, and we'll go into the details in a moment, why do they run bug bounty programs? Why do they run BDPs? Like, it's easy to listen to um, the marketing. It's easy to hear the impact 
as you all think of it, but let's actually have an internal moment. It's like, what are they thinking? What are their goals when they start one of these programs? Well, first off, ideally, the dream is, of course, that they want to find more security vulnerabilities and secure their products. Like, that's, that's the ideal goal, right, of course. But just to be honest with you, it is not always the primary reason. Um, some organizations feel it necessary to protect themselves from O-days or random disclosures on Twitter or stuff like that, which is very reasonable, especially organizations that have a lot of brand concern. They want to get ahead of it, and so they want to be able to give finders, whether they're ethical security researchers, random users that happen to find a bug, uh, customers that happen to find a bug, they want to have some way of officially being able to absorb those so they don't get dinged and potentially mess up ingesting that bug externally, because most organizations have no way or means to really smoothly ingest a security vulnerability. Um, and so a lot of times, the br brand and risk management is a key consideration when starting one of these programs. Um, and unfortunately, the reality is sometimes we say in America they're checking a box, like, you know, there's a form, like, yes, we did that, but you don't go into depth on whether you did a good job there or not. Um, a lot of organizations want to say this, or increasingly want to say this, so they can say that to their customers because their customers themselves are asking these questions. Why are their customers asking these questions? One, I think the bug bounty industry in general, all of the vendors have done a phenomenal job of normalizing this. A lot of the big bug bounty programs that are independent um, have done a great job of normalizing this. And there's been phenomenal press, and the entire conversation about this has changed. So, um, a lot of organizations, like say fi um, financial institutions, governments, things like that, they have vendor security programs. They have to make sure that their vendors are safe. A lot of the biggest breaches we've heard about are actually uh, in, in industry, like in publicly traded companies, are not actually uh, tax on the company themselves. A lot of times, they were breached via a vendor. And so the vendor security conversation has gotten very, very intense in so, uh, lately. Um, another interesting thing is if there is a breach, there is emerging government policy that does see whether or not um, the organization had a bug bounty program or a vulnerability disclosure program. It shows intent. It shows that they were trying. Um, I won't name names, but there's U.S. government organizations, lawyers, and U.S. government regulatory organizations that have explicitly said, like, this is something they look at when they're trying to see whether the officers of a publicly traded company have been negligent. Like, this is a real thing that's happening. So, despite all this, and what I just said, it's actually really interesting, but starting a program is actually really, really hard. And running one's really hard, too. We're not going to get into the running part too much today. We're going to get into the starting part, so we can kind of go into the nitty-gritty details and kind of mechanics and uh, talk about some trends a little bit. But um, in a software company, let's say a startup, this actually isn't too bad. They're new. The code base is new. It's a small team. They move fast and break things. It's really cool. But if you work for a traditional organization or an old, older organization or have a very old product, it's you're pushing a, a boulder up the hill sometimes. And um, is that experience rewarding? <laughs> um, is it for the person who's doing it? Yeah, because they're going to make their product and organization more secure, for sure. But um, does it look like this when it all is said and done and the program's ready to launch? No. It does, they don't look like this at all. They look a little bit more like this. And they haven't even gotten a bug yet to be honest with you, in a lot of cases. This isn't universal, of course, there's some places where this goes great, but a lot of the cases, there's a lot of internal fatigue by, by the time they hit the go button sometimes for the individual people involved, the people that are going to be on the other side of your bugs, like the individual human beings. Like, let's not think of a monolithic organization like 100,000 people or 50,000 people. Let's talk about the one or two poor souls that you'll be dealing with, because that's really how this works. Um, there's a lot of professional risk in this, too. Like, they're sticking their necks out sometimes. They're passionate about something, but they have to convince other organizations. Things go wrong. They're taking on personal risk. It's a real thing. This is actually such a problem that, um, not to make this about me for a second, but just to show what's going on. 
Um, I was invited, I didn't even submit a talk. I didn't submit to ask a talk, they actually approached me. And they asked me to give a talk at Black Hat this last year about how to start a bug bounty program. How do you go through this? What are the mechanics of it? What are the decision points? Like, what things do you even need to consider? Like, it's overwhelming for these organizations, especially ones that want to do it right, especially ones that have very robust legal departments or have very, very large and disparate engineering organizations. It's tough. Um, that went over well enough where they asked me to give the same talk again at Black Hat EU's Executive Summit with a little bit of a strategic twist and less tactical in the weeds. Um, and I mentioned that, and I want to, I'll get back to like these talks in a second, but like let me show you one of the, the fundamental guide map of that deck. To be able to start a bug bounty program, all of these decisions need to be made. They have to cover off all of these points. These are not small things. They're actually quite a lot, and it's really quite challenging. Um, this is less important for VDPs, by the way, but bug bounty programs, all of these things are really, really important. Um, here's, a, here's actually how I start out that talk conversation. Like, we need to have a reality check a little bit, because a lot of organizations are like, I want to do bug bounty. This is super cool. We love it. And then sometimes we got to go like, okay, we need to ask some tough questions here because um, we don't want to set our clients up for failure, of course. We want to make sure they have a successful program, a great experience. They give you all a great experience as finders. They, we want to make sure things go well. So we ask some like really fundamental questions. Like these are the basics of running a security program. Like how good are you at fixing bugs? You would think that would be the basic con basic role of a security team is getting bugs fixed. But this is highly variable. Um, do they have an incident response process? Now you wouldn't think like what's incident and response related to bug bounty, but the reality is is the process internally for maybe handling a high criticality issue that might make um, be disclosed, might actually get some attention from customers or press. The internal processes around that are, so, and the stakeholders involved just to con discuss that stuff, are frequently the same people who do with incident response. Just in a less panicky way, ideally. Of course, also you all want fast responses, and so how much time does the security team have to respond? Like, do they have bandwidth to actually be quick? Um, how well are their products tested? If they like, re like, just release their product like that, and like you, and let bug bounty testing happen, well, like, how well has it been tested in the past? Are you going to get deluged, or do you feel like the product's reasonably tested? Um, is your code base changing a lot? Because if you're if there's parts of your product that are changing a lot, those are most likely going to get a lot more attention than really old parts of the code base that maybe have been tested over and over and over again in years. These are all things they have to keep in mind to be able to figure out scope, how much money they want to spend, really, how do they define the success of their program? Like, from you all, you think, well, of course the program's successful, they're getting bugs. But, like, well, they're getting the kind of bugs that they want. Is this valuable to them? Is the effort that they're expending um, working with you all worth it compared to the other things they could be doing. Like, there's a lot going on in security teams. Their fundamental job is to prevent bugs. Bug bounty is inherently reactionary in most cases. Like, the bugs in production. A good security team prevents bugs, and not all security teams can do that. They're not enabled for that success. But that's the goal, really. We should be preventing bugs. Like, at the fundamental level, we're like, engineers should not be writing insecure code. And that's a problem the whole industry has not solved. Like, that's a huge, huge problem. And these are things we need to, uh, that are top of mind for the folks on the other side of your bugs. Now, you're probably thinking right now, this is interesting, but why does it matter to me as a finder? It, it, which is a valid question, we're gonna get into it. Here's the problem. The whole concept of bug bounty originated and like really grew. Uh, Mozilla and a few other organizations deserve to be up here, here too. Um, for creating the concept in terms of making it big and normalizing a lot of the behaviors that are um, common today in bug bounty programs really came from three, three, these three companies. But here's the problem with these three companies. They're software juggernauts. They're all new and they have like ridiculous amounts of money. Like they literally just print money. It's incredible. And so they're working on a resource level uh, and also a software engineering level that most organizations just simply or not, but a lot of the expectations and behaviors you all have come from these places. And not everyone can be Google. It's just being real. Most organizations are not Google. They're not Facebook. They're not Microsoft. They're, they're, they're in a different league of their own. 
So after, what's interesting is after I gave both of these talks, I got like deluged with like people wanting to talk to me. Immediately after the talk, follow-up conversations, NCC Group is a consulting organization, so there did, was some biz dev around this. But honestly, like, we have relationships with a lot of these organizations, so we give a lot of free consulting away just, just because, like, we're NCC Group and that's what we do. Um, and you know what I heard the most? This is what I just said. We're not Google. We're not Microsoft. We are not going to be able to operate programs at the level of these organizations. And that terrifies them because the reality, they see that the expectations for how bug bounty should go are rotated around them. So let's talk about those expectations and those concerns so you can understand. Let's talk about speed of fixes. Facebook and a lot of startups, if they absolutely need to, they can turn around and fix in production in one day. Not all the time, not always necessary, important, but they physically have the ability to do it. But most companies don't. They have longer fix cycles um, for various reasons. Maybe that's just the way they did, that's the way the whole engineering org was structured. That's the way the release cycle was designed like 10, 15, 20, 25 years ago, and they haven't gotten any pressure to change it. Um, the way they deploy software, like on-prem servers and stuff like that, doesn't really allow for them to like, yes, they can create a fix, but how long is it going to take to get into their customer's production environment? Months? Um, and actually, probably one of the bigger ones that's interesting is they have to do a lot of QA. You know, Facebook says move fast and break things, but like everybody else, like this is like serious stuff and they can get in a lot of trouble if they wind up like bricking servers or they wind up causing uh, an outage or some other unintended behavior, some other business logic behavior that can lose them money. Some organizations take a do months of functional testing and they just can't turn a fix around overnight. But unfortunately, fast fixes, like when's the fix, when's my bounty? It's programmed in. You can see it everywhere. You look at the disclosed bugs on Hacker One. You see, like, where's my fix? Where's my fix? Where's my fix? Like, they're doing their best sometimes. Um, another interesting one is the co is age of code. It's fascinating, really. Um, we're just so used to the web and new apps coming out all the time on mobile uh, and dub dub dub. But frequently, sometimes, some of the most mission critical apps we use in our regular lives are, just have like a nice fancy front end on a mainframe. And a lot of the core business logic is actually back in mainframe. You buy plane tickets, you do banking, you pay utility bills, you buy anything in a retail store. A vast majority of retail works on AS400, it's a mainframe. Now you can go check out on like walmart.com or target.com super fast and there's a nice UI on top of that but all the way deep, 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 deep in the back, you hit a mainframe. That means stuff to the security org. That means something to the software engineering org and how they actually approach fixing software. Um, especially if there's complex business logic in the mainframe and they try to replicate that in the front end, which is uh, some organizations I can't name do where they replicate the, they attempt to replicate all of the back-end logic in mainframe in the front end because there's no data integrity checks going into the mainframe. And so they don't want to pollute the mainframe. It's fascinating. And so it's a very, very complicated problem. They have to do months of testing sometimes. Um, the other interesting thing is that they don't really all the time have a huge business incentive to make things better to release code faster, to do testing faster, all of these things. There's a lot of industries that are super behind on this stuff, not because they're wrong necessarily, but because there's competitive pressures in the customer industry itself. So if you think about the, vend the software vendors that support healthcare, that support the law industry, that support logistics industry, I'm not talking about like FedEx or UPS, which have their own things, but like smaller logistical organ logistics companies, shipping, stuff like that. They are very margin sensitive. They have, they want to spend money. They want to make security better, but they can't exactly go rebuild their entire stack so they can release a fix in a week. They're just not going to do it. So still, you all are probably like, hashtag whatever. I want to five bugs. Why does this mean to me? It's all valid. But here's the thing. Um, 
it is reasonable for us to expect for organizations to move on, to evolve, to react to modern technology, to react to modern security expectations. Shareholders are starting to care enough. These breaches are hitting stocks where it's starting to matter. So they are paying attention. But they have investors. Now, you know what investors like? Profit. And one of the interesting problems is, is that these organizations really have to balance their investments quite a bit. I think I'm getting like another talk in here or something. Okay. Um, so organizations have to invest in a lot of stuff. And it's, it's kind of hard to describe it. Like, you know, the reality is, is they want to invest, they want to improve, but they, like I was saying, they, op they operate in these hyper-competitive environments where they just can't invest because otherwise they become expensive. They lose business. A lot of their buyers don't care about security. And just being honest, especially once you get out of like the Fortune 500 into like smaller organizations, their customers don't care that they have spent all this money making themselves secure. They really don't. Because they have their own competitive pressures on price. So the more requirements they put on their software vendors, the more expensive their software vendors are going to be. Thus, the more expensive they are. And then they're going to lose business. Like we have to think about the bare metal of like who's cutting the checks, who's buying these services that are being supported by this software. And sometimes they're very price sensitive. Many customers also don't want their vendors to change the way they operate. Um, I live in Las Vegas. I uh, recently moved there. I have a kid. I need a little bit of space. Just, I left San Francisco. Um, it's a t standard path at this point. Uh, I went to a birthday party for my, uh, one of my uh, son's friends in school, and I was just chatting with some parents. And one of the people uh, I met was a senior person at a company that supports casino gaming and operations. And they're a newer company. They're starting, they're building from zero. They think there's a competitive advantage. They thought there was a competitive advantage in building from zero, new software, not having this old legacy stuff where it takes months to do any sort of co-change. But they built their stuff in the cloud. And the casinos are like terrified of that. The casinos are actually not buying stuff because they're like, we don't want stuff in the cloud. The cloud's scary. Like they're, they're doing the right thing. They're actually thinking, they actually approach this like, this is a competitive advantage of ours. And it's challenging for them. It's really, really interesting uh, that their buyers are pushing back against this evolution. And that kind of behavior cascades all the way through to you all who are doing research, security research, and the experiences you have, and the scopes you have, and the bounties you get, and the speed in which organizations respond, and what organizations even have programs. It starts all the way there, five companies through, on the original buyer who's cutting checks for these products and services. It's fascinating, really. So again, why does this matter to you? Like, what does this effectively matter to you? Instead of just an FYI, what does this mean? Let's go back to this for a second. Let's talk about what actual objections happen in the room when a security organization says, we want to do bug bounty, or we want to do a vulnerability disclosure program. And um, they have a vendor in their room. They could be any of the vendors. It doesn't really matter. Who do you think is really the problem? Who do you think is really pushing back on this stuff? Usually it's these two. Depends on the country. Depends on the industry. So, you know, it could be 50-50, 60-40 between these two. But overwhelmingly, it's these two. Sometimes sales pushes back. Sometimes comms, PR, public relations is in the room. But overwhelmingly, it's these two organizations. And I want to show you the slide I put up in front of senior executives on this topic, because they need help. They literally are asking for help here. What do you need to have a successful bug bounty program where you can fix things quickly and meet the expectations and be as good as some of these founding organizations and fixing stuff? If you look at this list, it's kind of fundamental stuff. Like, do you have a good working relationship with the software engineering organization? <laughs> do you know how they prioritize bug fix defects? Let's talk about in, in software engineering and product organization terms. How do they manage and decide defects? I've always been surprised by how many customers and organizations I talk to, security organizations I talk to, can't give me a really great answer on that. 
because they're security people. They've never worked in a software engineering org. They don't understand the dynamics of that work. They don't understand always the pressures on them and the dynamics that happen in sprint reviews meetings, in sprint planning meetings. It's fascinating. And these are really basic things. And we spend a lot of time helping organizations with that. But you know, even though they talk about this in terms of internal operational logistics, you know what they're really scared of? The horde. Hello, by the way. Um, they're terrified of that. Because their history is they've done, and this is coming from NCC Group, it's a pen testing company. They're used to annual pen tests on a recurring basis. They plan for it. They tell the software engineer or six months in advance, we do our pen tests in February or May or whatever. And the software engineering org plans for that. They budget that time in to their release cycle, to their feature releases, to their bug fixes and other defects. So the idea of now you have this dynamic um, volume of potentially severe security bugs that interrupts the sprint cycle, scary. There's product managers and product organizations that are bonus on landing features, on uh, landing a feature itself, or landing a feature and making sure it generates new revenue. If you were that product manager and your bonus is on the line, how would you feel about someone suddenly showing up and be like, yeah, at any time you might like have to completely interrupt the sprint cycle? You're not going to be super duper happy, are you? They're just being honest. Now, they're receptive. They want things to be more secure. They want to figure things out. But they meet the initial response is like, what does this mean for me as a product manager, as a software engineering manager? It's a real thing. Now, on the legal side, they worry about this. <laughs> like, suddenly, they're going to go from, like, obscurity to CNN. Um, and it's, this kind of gets to um, the whole point of this talk is, why is this happening? I made this a generic statement because it can mean so many things. Why is this happening? There's so many things. But this is meant to be from your perspective to some extent. It's like, why, is the, why are the things you're seeing happening? What's going on behind the scenes? There's a lot of companies playing this space. And this is not comprehensive, by the way. So I apologize to anyone who should be on this. I'm just trying to like, make a quick slide here. And we're all independently, and honestly, in, at the moment, in the bug bounty and vulnerability disclosure vendor space, rising water raises all ships. We're all still so new. There's still so much new business. We could all, we're all going to do great. As long as we don't individually mess up the way we execute, we'll all do fine. There's just so much business to go around right now. And we also, the successes of our competitors are successes for us to validate what we're doing, to provide examples, to make people okay with taking what they perceive to be as a risk. So I'm happy when my competitors win work because it proves the model. It gives us another example to show, listen, it's okay. And we're all doing this independently. We don't really coordinate, of course, we're competitors, right? Um, but why is this happening? You're, you're maybe seeing some things going on. We've certainly observed it that VDP launches are becoming more common than bug bounty launches. This has been going on for a little bit. You see different government organizations pushing for VDP more. Um, you see vendor security programs starting to ask about VDPs. They're not necessarily pushing for bug bounties. They sometimes are. But a lot of times they're expecting VDPs. They're expecting that transparency. They're expecting an organization to have the wherewithal to, have, to be able to ingest the security vulnerability from a non-NDA person and be able to handle that in a responsible, effective way. Like, it seems very reasonable to do. But it's tough. But why are they doing VDPs? Well, to get this over the finish line, to get over these fears, to be able to, like, actually land it with all the stakeholders, no payouts means you're asking for smaller budget. If you're doing, like, a bug bounty or VDP, you're asking for more money. And that's always a fun conversation, right? Now, there's... Sometimes senior executive support, and that's great, and it goes much more easily, but frequently there's not. And so the smaller budget request, the easy is to get done. The small budget request means it can be a pilot. That can be the difference between getting a Like, it's a pilot, we can turn it off. They, they tell them that, but like, realistically they're not because they're going to get value out of it. Of course they won't, but they, it puts them at ease. No pants means they're less worried about the horde showing up and they're going to have lower volume. Like, they want the bugs, but at the same time they don't want to get deluged. They're also very afraid of being deluged with bugs they don't necessarily um, immediately want. I won't say they won't care about them because they do care about bugs, but it's not fair to clients to say they don't care about bugs. But the reality is when you sequence 
um, low to medium severity security bugs next to all the other things they have, all the defects, all the new features, maybe they don't line up or like you work on them where you don't work on them for a few months, which is probably very frustrating for the finder. But the reality is, is that if they push too hard, they'll just get cut off. Because the security team's not the only people, not the people, not the only people playing this game. They're not the only people who have a say. They're, they're your advocates, really. And you have to give them the space to be successful in the space that they have. They're going to push the best that they can. You're also going to see private, there's a ton of private invite only bug bounty programs. And, um, a lot of that is strict, strict non-disclosure terms, which we can have a philosophical discussion about the rightness of that. I think it's very reasonable for the industry to have a reasonable conversation about strict non-disclosure terms. I think it goes either way. It depends on the client's goals, depends on the product. There's a lot of complication here, but it puts them at ease. It chills out the legal team. And again, um, fewer participants means lower volume, means a lower budget request, means no hoard. That's how these things get sold in organizations that have legitimate concerns or maybe are just kind of um, old school and not familiar with this stuff. I, I spend a lot of time just educating C-suites. Like, what do you mean hackers are okay? <laughs> like, like, really basic stuff. What does a good security Hi, program um, look like? Uh, first, good morning uh, to all of you. Uh, so... Welcome to the Talking next about talk. the human factor, <laughs> uh, usually we say that uh, uh, the human oh, or the moment. employee Instead is the like, weakest link. Trying to in the like organization. listen to two talks simultaneously. But that would if be we impressive. kind of put it in a more positive self fashion, I would say that you know the employee can actually be the this is, greatest strength, like you not know, that you have. That is true. So I would say that you know from a human factor, it is true. I mean, like on you know, statistics do indicate that. Um, 25% like you know of incidents are purely just because of some employee like you know actually making an error right i mean an employee clicking on a link etc um so i would say that the two uh, aspects that uh, we as uh, cisos need to focus on is uh, see, and, and we use this word awareness uh, very often uh, but i would say that you know if 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 we if we look at training i mean training people uh, to be um, uh, self-reliant and to be able to defend the organization. So I would say for the employees, one aspect I would um, emphasize is the amount of training that you can give on a repeated fashion. And when I, when I mean training, where I would like us to be a little different is that, you know, people, every, all people, business. Oh, well, that was quick. Thank you, guys. Thank you to the AV team. I'll tell you, being the AV person sucks. So it's really, <laughs> yes, it does. It, it is the most thankless and most important job in a conference, and we have to be tolerant when things go wrong, especially the first day and the first talk, because have you seen how many wires are over there? It's crazy. So, all right, let's get back on track. So, um, I think I was finished with the slide moving on, so let's go for it. So here's some other things you see when you start, which can be very frustrating to you all. Reasonably so. The scopes are really small. Some organizations, to really test their product, they have to spin up instances, they have to issue creds. Some instances are very expensive. I've had a client where I think a full instance of their product costs something like $1,000 a month to run in the cloud per instance of course security researchers are like give me an instance give me two instances so i can test them against each other all stuff like ho oh, nelly you have to think about the actual cost of running some of these very complex enterprise products it's not cheap um so sometimes you get kind of like a small tiny test instance now everything works right it's feature limited maybe you can't test like a parser because it's too computationally intensive but they limit that for those testing environments. There's all kinds of little things that happen. Very frustrating for a tester. We experience that as pen testers as well. It's super real. It's a valid thing. Or ideally we'd be fully testing. But there is a lot of operational logistics to spinning up these instances. 
especially if you want to say give 50 of them out or 60 of them out. Like organizations do do this, but it sometimes takes quite a bit of wherewithal. Again, smaller payouts, frustrating. This is your time. Your time's worth money. So obviously you want high payouts, especially if it's high criticality bug. But the reality is, is like if this program just started, they probably have a little bit of budget. And so they're just trying to get started. They want to prove that success. Let's just kick the tires on this thing. Let's just try it. And then we can spend more money. And then we can go back and prove the value of this and get real money so we can have like an awesome program. Um, also, it helps them feel like they're not opening themselves up for a flood because if they pay out tons of money, they're scared that everybody and their grandmother is going to show up and start just sending bugs their way, real or not. And slower fixes. I assure you, every software engineering organization in the world would love to fix things faster. Like, just being real. It's not like they like enjoy taking months to fix something. It's not great. But there are logistical resource realities to this stuff. Another interesting thing, which is why sometimes it's good to just kind of get in early and just kind of like get your, as an organization, get your like your toehold into VDP or bug bounty, is that when these bugs are coming in, it really shows the clunkiness of a lot of organizations' vulnerability management practices. Like it shows that, well, should that bug, should we really have taken three months to fix it? We probably could have done better. And it helps drive organizational change, it helps drive conversation, it helps drive improvement. It really is. Bug bounty and VDPs are some of the best drivers of vulnerability management uh, I've seen in organizations. This might be frustrating for you to hear. We're in revolutionary times, I would say, politically around the world. And so there's a constant, we're, I think we're in a time where there's a very real tension between step-by-step -step incremental improvement and revolutionary change. Naturally, especially being finders who are on the receiving end of money, you would rather this happen a little bit faster. Undoubtedly. You would rather organizations cut to the chase. You'd rather these organizations pay out big bounties, have huge scopes, all kind of good stuff. But um, Honestly, this is a, kind of like a personal judgment, and the decision on how to approach it is extremely local to the organization and circumstances. You can't just make a blanket statement on this stuff. It's just not possible. There's so many little tiny details to an organization that drive this stuff. And um, personal opinion, having been in government at one time in my life in like a massive, huge, enormous bureaucracy, um, and also worked in large companies, is that um, while politically we can talk about, you know, uh, incremental improvements versus uh, revolution. In the commercial space, large groups of people working together usually do better in incremental improvement. If you like suddenly change the world around them, large groups of people suddenly don't know what the norms are. They don't know how to work together, and they spend a lot of time churning on just like how to work instead of like actually dealing with the revolutionary change. They're like trying to just like deal with the day to day again, and it's disruptive. And so it's much easier to have like a one or two year plan. Where everybody knows, like, oh, a year, two years from now, here's the end goal. And we're going to incrementally work through this. We're going to check step by step. No one's freaked out. Everybody knows what's going to happen, and we can stay in sync. I'd also like to talk about some trends that, these are small trends, but they're worthy of note because they get an inordinate amount of attention, and they work to all of our disadvantage. I've seen a lot of purity testing lately. It's a term in American politics, where it's like, you're not enough of something unless you do this. I've started to get whiffs looking at bug reports, talking to folks, hearing what organizations are feeling and afraid of when they're looking at starting this stuff, that VDP is not enough. If you know the history of ethical security research, remember, no more free bugs, it's a real thing. And there's valid complaints about VDPs and the idea of not paying out bounties. Of course, their intention is different internally. The way these are sold is internal, internally quite different than a bug bounty program. VDP's goal is just to have like an official way for people to disclose stuff. Bug bounty is about incentivizing security research. Bug bounties are meant to like throw money out there to get you all to show up. VDPs are there in case somebody sees something. The difference is important but subtle, less obvious to you all than maybe the organization that started this and the way they're thinking about it and what they expect to happen with their programs. Um, I've seen a lot of this lately, get a lot of phone calls from our existing clients over this stuff. 
is um, some researchers are doing security research in organizations that don't have bug bounties and don't have VDPs. And they show up, and they find a bug, and they go through some mechanism to eventually find somebody who will look at the bug through support, emailing the CEO. Like, There's lots of different ways this randomly happens, which is the purpose VDPs are supposed to fix. And they kind of explicitly try to pressure them for bounties. They're not just trying to do vulnerability disclosure. They're not just like, oh, I found something, here you go, which would be a BDP, of course. But they go one step further and kind of demand a bounty. And there's some language gaps here. This is not unique to India by any means. There's some language gaps, but sometimes these feel a little bit like extortion. Where it's like, I'm not going to tell you the bug until you tell me what the bounty is. I'm like, well, hold on. That's not even how bug bounty works, <laughs> right? Bug bounty is usually you give them the bug, you give them everything, and then they make a decision. And ultimately, decision on whether the bounty in bug bounty is on the organization. You may not get paid out. That's actually an important legal tax ramification thing, like, like employment law thing that's very necessary for this whole thing to work in most like a US and European employment law. We can't guarantee a bounty. It's very important. And so the idea that these people just show up and do random security research on organizations they know don't have a VDP for the purpose of kind of getting a bounty out of them, it doesn't happen a ton. It does happen, though. And holy guacamole, everyone hears about it. You want to talk about what gets talked at CISO summits, like in the networking time, like, uh, like these sort of stories spread like wildfire. And it really does tons of damage to legitimate BDP and bug bounty programs because they're expecting that behavior to be normal because that's their only touch point. It's not good for any of us. And we need to call it out. Do these organizations, if, if you find something in an organization that doesn't have a BDP or bug bounty program, should you disclose it to them? Absolutely. Should you expect a bounty? Or even talk about bounties? It's probably not. Maybe there's some circumstances where maybe the organization might be thankful for it and do it anyway. That's on them. But starting the conversation that way or even bringing it up themselves, it leaves a, it, it, it kind of undermines trust in the dynamic of what is supposed to be vulnerability disclosure. And it's not a good scene and it does a lot of damage. On top of those little stories, which again are, are a small minority, but get a lot of attention. They go on a hacker one in Bug Crowd's websites and see metrics on expectations on fixes and response times and stuff like that. And that's intense. And this is just on the internet. How many organi security organizations or software engineering organizations have ever had their fixed timelines published on the internet? I mean, if you're an open source program, sure, product. But everyone else, like these are things they don't even tell their customers sometimes. And now, like, oh, I have to, if I have a VDP like this, my fixed times are literally out there for not just researchers to see, but my customers, my competitors. These are real concerns. They want to make sure they do a good job. And that's where we get to the beginning of this talk. So what can we all do? We need to support organizations with VDPs and new private programs. We need to be enabling. We need to be positive. They're trying their best. I'm not trying to say that there's no bad actors here. Just as there's some bad actor researchers who are doing sketchy stuff, there are certainly programs that could be doing a way better job. No doubt. But the vast majority of people want to do a good job and go home on time. Like as humans. Like the, the handful of people on the other side of your bug want to do a good job. People in security are passionate about security. Like, there's a reason they're here, overwhelmingly. Like, this isn't a cynical thing. This is a very real thing. And so we got to give them some space. Maybe not judge so hard. Because um, the more common this gets, the more bug bounty programs there are, and the more interesting bug bounty programs there are. We've only scratched the surface of where bug bounty and BDP have gone. Only scratched the surface. Just out of curiosity, who in this room does pen testing for a living? Okay, cool. So you all probably know better than most, like there is a lot of targets out there that are, would be very hard to test in bug bounty land, if not impossible. I think it's possible to test a lot more in bug bounty. I think it's possible to open that scope up. 
But this is something where each individual product, each indiv depending upon its deployment strategy, depending upon its customer base, depending upon how they do QA, all these things will determine how we get bug bounty and VDP ubiquitous to the entire uh, product base of an organization. How do you start bug bounty infrastructure? There are absolutely infrastructure and like IT bug bounty programs, which is very bold, awesome, and I love it. Terrifying for most organizations, but we can get there. But we gotta like understand the stressors that prevent that from happening. We all need to work together here. Like this is like by our powers combined, bug bounty and VDP will become even more normal beyond the existing industry that it's in today. It's deep in like the software juggernauts in Silicon Valley. It's expanding into other so very software-oriented organizations. But what about organizations that are not inherently software organizations? Like they happen to write software, but they don't think of themselves as software companies. They just happen to have it. Or maybe they have a third party, one-off contract contractor build them a solution. How do they handle that? There's all these things, and we need to be able to wrap our heads around that and understand and understand that those programs are going to feel a little bit different, behave a little bit different, and certainly not be like the ones that are run by the likes of Facebook, Google, and Microsoft by any means. Because, well, I talked about incremental change before. The reality is if you go from today and you look six years back, what's happened so far in the space feels revolutionary, but it wasn't revolutionary. It was step by step. This became normal incrementally. And as this, as vulnerability disclosure and bug bounty grows even more into even more industries, into companies that are not software companies, to industries that like don't even think about the software they're using. It's just normal for them, they, but they don't think of themselves making software. As we grow into there, that's where we're, you look back again five years from now, if we get that far, that will be truly re revolutionary. And with that, I thank you so much for attending. Welcome to NullCon. Please grab me later. Do we have time for questions? We should. Ah, sweet. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, like, what should be the key elements uh, which we should uh, consider when opting for bug bounty programs? Like, I'm planning for, uh, uh, like, Hacker One or NCC or any other. So, what should be the major elements which I consider when uh, finalizing any one of the platform? Um, could you ask the question again? I'm not sure what the question is. Uh, like, I'm planning to opt for uh, some Hacker One or NCC or any other group mm -hmm. uh, for my organization. So, what should be the key elements which I consider uh, about finalizing one of them? Oh, the key internal events before you launch a program? Yeah. Um, there's a few things there. One, uh, you need like stakeholder buy-in from legal, PR, sales, marketing, all that kind of good stuff, um, which can be variably challenging, of course. Um, I think another thing is to make sure that you've done thorough internal testing so you know what your risk profile is. I'm not trying to promote pen testing here because you could do it internally yourselves or whatever, but it's probably a good diligence thing to understand what, um, how secure you really are and what the quality of your code really is. Um, and also understanding the release cycle in more depth. A lot of security organizations struggle with syncing up with this, with the release cycle. And I think, um, sequencing all those things together uh, is probably your key to success. Does that answer your question? Yes, partially, but yes, I understand. I can relate it now. Mm, Paul, like, you can hit, hit me up with more if you're not sure. You're all good? Yeah, I'll, I'll not uh, hold everyone, so I will talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. Cool, there's a question behind you. Thank you. Thank yeah, hit me up later, please. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Jerry. Uh, I'm a pen tester. Um, so recently I was actually um, just serving surfing through the internet and I found an e-commerce website, though I would not like to name them. And apparently that website has an SQL injection, though I reported them. But when I visited uh, the bug crowd or hacker one, I don't see them anywhere in the bug bounty programs and anything. So how could I encourage them to join these two platforms or any other platform, so to speak? Um, so this is, this is, um, giving them a great experience, being a professional. Like, if you're a pen tester, you know what engaging with an organization 
feels like and looks like and what they're used to. And you should assume that they've been on the other side of a pen test. I think the key thing is, is to give them a great experience and not push too hard, right? Um, obviously, depend, there's so much that depends on the bug and the organizations and things like that. But I think you have to give them the space to say, hey, I found this bug. We're cool. You can ask. You, ideally, you would ask, like, hey, I'd love to talk about this bug, and we can talk about what that might look like. Um, I probably wouldn't talk about bounties because that's not fair, I think. If you think it, what you're doing in terms of just pure vulnerability disclosure, there's no bounties involved. And because what, what winds up happening is when they get these disclosures, inevitably, um, at least somewhat more mature organizations with more um, stronger security teams wind up reaching out to one of the bug bounty vendors afterwards. Like, what's going on? They sometimes do it mid-flight while they're still ingesting the bug, trying to figure out what to do. Like, what's normal? How do we not get ourselves in trouble? All that kind of stuff. And so they engage us, and then we can help them through that process. And so honestly, sometimes these sorts of things prompt that conversation. And the better that interaction with the researcher goes, the more open they are to be like, hey, you know, we should just start a vulnerability disclosure program so we can just like not be chaotic about this next time. Because like the chaotic experience internally is the worst part for them. And if you're not applying external pressure that like freaks them out and makes them worry about their public image and stuff like that, it actually gives them the space to think internally. It's like, wow, like we did not do a great job with that internally. You don't necessarily see that beside it taking maybe two weeks for them to get back to you or something while they churn internally because that's what's happening sometimes. They're just literally just grinding gears internally because they don't know what to do. If you give them that space, a lot of times they're like, well, we'd rather like do a better job with this next time. And what's, well, what can we do to do that? So honestly, I think these bugs actually do a great job at, put, at promoting VDP as long as you give them the space to fail internally and not just fail externally too, if that makes sense. Does that help? Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Absolutely. Uh, it's more of like I need your opinion and want to share uh, two instances. Uh, I reported bugs under responsible disclosure program to two different organizations. One of them was the reflected access and, and another one was the access control. So what happened was one of them didn't even acknowledge me and after a few days when I like send, I just sent a follow-up email that was the status on the bug that I reported. Again, when there was no response, I just tried to like check whether it exists or not and it was fixed. In mm -hmm. another scenario, like I reported it, they acknowledged me, they said we will send you a swag and we will add your name to Hall of Fame. I just uh, send them my details, but they didn't send me any swag or not add my name in the Hall of Fame. And mm -hmm. after a few days, that bug was also fixed. So like, uh, is it like, should we go on Twitter and expose these pro organizations who are running, who are doing such things? Because kind of, it's kind of a, like cheating with the researchers. Yeah, it's, it, it's, this is a very hard problem to, to solve. I think, honestly, I can't give you a great answer on that one because I think a lot of it is the internal, is the specific details of the bug and how you engage with them, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. Uh, without knowing the whole story, it's really hard to give like an objective opinion on this stuff. From uh, my, I would say I would always err on the side of like not disclosing on them ideally. But if they've fixed that bug um, and you want some recognition on it, I would ask them about disclosure after it's fixed. Like, hey, you fixed it. I would like to talk about this bug. Even be open about it. Like um, a lot of programs will say, hey, like let's work together on what like the, the disclosure summary looks like, like what our perspective. So we can actually, as an organization, give some insight into our, our perspective of that bug, how severe it is, what the impact was, and stuff like that, and just offer that kind of thing. And um, that's the best you can do. And honestly, it's a personal judgment from there whether you you drop that. But I would always, always say, if they fix the bug, let them fix the bug. Do not, like, O-day them on um, a real-life blog. Put them and their customers at risk because that kind of undermines us a little bit. There was one more question over here, I think, and then I'm done. I hope that was a satisfying answer. It's a tough situation, to be honest with you. I would just try to be the best, always try to have the higher ground. Right. Always try to have the higher ground, I think. Uh, yeah, great talk. Uh, I work for the Zero Day Initiative. Oh, hi. So <laughs> we've, we've been in the space for a bit. And one of the things that occurred to me is that, well, with programs like ours, a lot of companies have wound up in the bug bounty business without uh, intending to be, right? Because we provide the bounty. And uh, what is maybe terrifying is that we 
give it to the vendor and we say, yeah, you got 120 days. Mm -hmm. And, and so if they don't have the processes set up, they suddenly get very surprised. Um, and I was wondering if you ever run into companies that said, look, we've, we've been hit by this kind of thing. And can you help us set up a more proper internal, uh, framework for handling it through ourselves instead of just getting hit from people like me? Yeah. I, I don't want to use this stage to promote NCC group by any means, which it's hard to answer that question, honestly, without promoting the company. If I want to stay neutral here, I would say the answer is yes to that. Um, it's a non-trivial line of business. Um, but the organizations that reach out to us usually have good intent and are completely freaked out. <laughs> just to be honest with you, they're completely freaked out and they're looking for help. And um, like job one for me is just like chill them out. It's like, it's okay. Breathe. Breathe. <sighs> I have a kid, so I've been breathing exercises with my wife. <sighs> like, you know, like you need to make him laugh a little bit and be like, yo, this happens every day in programs that are formal. You guys just don't have their internal mechanics. Let's just work through it. It's just an operational problem. Uh, but it is, a, it is a real thing. And overwhelmingly, I would say what winds up getting fixed and getting, getting the most focus is not actually the VDP, the externally facing part, but instead the vulnerability management program. Overwhelmingly, that's where a lot of the focus, because like they wind up just stumbling over themselves fixing stuff and incident response programs that wind up, they want to go like, on like the binder, <laughs> realize they haven't used it in five years and go like, Oh, everybody, all the point of POCs in this wiki, no one works here anymore. <laughs> and it's a real thing. So, um, yeah, I would say those are the things that actually get a lot of internal focus for the VDP part. That's kind of the last step. Like, okay, cool. We've got it together internally. Now let's do the external facing part. That's, I think at time. Thank you so much, everybody. Appreciate it.